Perfect. So let's get started. Um, I'm Hiram. We're going to be talking about sentiment prediction in real time in SQL Server. Is anyone in the room using the function predict or SPRX predict? OK, no one? You came to the right session. You're going to learn how to use it. The other question is, are there any Python developers in the room? I see a few hands. OK. R developers? OK. Oh, one hand. <laughs> OK. And that, that's pretty usual. I see more and more folks in the coming to the workplace that have Python skill. And R is a great skill to have. Uh, this session is not going to be of <clears throat> whether should I do it in R, whether should I do it in Java, or should I do it in Python. I personally have done it on both on R, every demo that I'm going to show you. There will be some Scala, so perhaps you may be familiar. If you're not familiar with Scala, this will be a good introduction to that. Um, the other point that I want to make uh, is that you could write these demos in your preferred language, uh, whether it be Python. Python for me is pretty easy language to pick up. It's very similar to TSQL in the sense that I can phonetically just read it. R was quite difficult, but there are certain functions in R that are very performant, and R traditionally uses scale across many nodes very easily, as opposed to Python, you, you would have to hit a single runtime. But from a development perspective, R, uh, Python was, uh, I'm seeing more and more folks coming straight out of the academia field with that skill. Uh, so if you're a T-SQL developer, Python is going to be very simple for you to start to pick up. Um, R might have a little bit more of a hurdle. <clears throat> so, so all of the slides that I'm going to be showing are already available uh, for you to download at that GitHub link. I also gave a session yesterday on the Power Platform, and the slides for that session are at the same GitHub link. All of the code that I'm going to be showing is available at that GitHub link, all of the demos as well. Uh, and like I mentioned, it's already available. If you could please silence your phone. I have to remember to do this even myself. I've been in sessions <laughs> where I'm speaking and my phone will go off. If you don't want to silence it, it's fine. Uh, you know, Metallica, Bad Bunny, I'm all <laughs> whatever ringtone you want to put on, it's, it's, it's good. Let's see here. All right, so that is an airplane mode. Definitely explore everything that PASS has to offer. Uh, there is, you've probably seen this slide all week. I'm not going to beat it into you, but the, the premise here is that there's a lot of free material out there that you can consume, including my blog. This is the site for my blog. I definitely post about the technology that I'm going to be sharing with you guys every so often. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to post them there. We love all the feedback, good and the bad. So I am going to be raffling some swag that my company was very generous to provide. They FedEx the swag overnight uh, from South Florida. Uh, so I have this quick eval. It's just going to ask you, rate it one through five. What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? And that is just for myself. I do not sell or share any of that. And the folks that do participate, uh, that do want to participate in the raffle, with the eval is just going to ask you your name. So yesterday I did this, and there were a, at least three Marks in the room, like people name, with the name Mark. So <laughs> my script to run the raffle, <laughs> didn't, it just made them a single Mark, because I selected distinct out of the array. Uh, my advice there <laughs> is put in like some number. Don't put in your birth date or your phone number, because it will come up on the screen. But put in a number right after your first name, and uh, we'll go ahead and do the raffle. Uh, just pick like a super random number. <laughs> and definitely do fill out the evals for the past summit. I'm sure you've seen this slide also a thousand times already this week. I very conveniently put the QR code up there. Um, it's, this is important. We don't get a lot of folks, unfortunately, filled uh, filling out the evals. Uh, what I do is on the flight back home, I fill out all of the evals. But if you do it during the conference, pass is raffling uh, to the folks that fill out the eval, even a ticket that you can come to summit for free. 
Um, so the, the session EVA for PASS is very important because it may determine whether as a speaker will be invited to come back and share content with you. So definitely take the time to do that. This is all my contact information. Um, work with the database systems at Universal Property. We're an insurance company. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a father. We, Christina, my wife, is right up here. So feel free to ask her any machine learning questions, too. <laughs> uh, we have two kids, a four-year-old and a one-year-old, and they're pretty amazing. Um, been a developer since I was 13 years old. The first app I wrote was a calculator. That was considered the AI in, <laughs> of back then. <laughs> so I fell in love with it ever since and been working with SQL for quite a while. I also started a company called Flatus Arts back in 2008. And I'm a staff officer with the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary. So if you have any questions around that, feel free to ask. So I have some badges up there, some recent certifications I accomplished this year that I'm pretty proud of. Um, definitely recommend that you try out pursuing some certifications. They are, are going to be of value to your skill set. And you have all my contact info there. We'll bring this up at the end as well. Here's a little information about Universal Insurance Holding. So Universal Insurance Holding is a parent company that I work for. And we've grown tremendously in the past two years that I've been with them. When I, was, uh, when I came on board, we were about less than 500 employees. Now we have over 800 employees. We were in 15 states. Now we're a few more, so we're doing business in a few more states. And we're headquartered out of Fort Lauderdale. So the state of Florida, most of our policyholders are in the state of Florida. So we have over 800,000 policies in the state of Florida. So hurricane season is uh, very busy for us. And not just being headquartered there, but it's very busy for our policyholders. So we're just going to jump straight into the demos from here. Now, this is a level 400 session. You guys are very ambitious to come for a 400 session at 8 AM. So I love you guys. You're awesome. There is a lot of code here. Uh, I am going to be going fast. and. The demos themselves, they're included in the slide deck. So that guarantees me that nothing's going to go wrong. I can do this presentation even from my cell phone if I had to, if this laptop dies or my SQL Server dies, or if I lose network connection. But uh, I will jump out of the slide deck and maybe do like, you know, hit F5. If you guys want me to move around the mouse, you know, I can just stand up here and move around the mouse too. <laughs> Um, so we're going to go through the setup process of adding the machine learning services features. Uh, I'm going to show you how to debug a Python app if you ever have to and do performance metrics on top of just the Python code itself. Um, I'm going to show you some performance comparisons of, I've been using this technology since 2016, since SQL Server 2016. So I'm going to show you some performance metrics in comparison of how it's gotten better from 2017 uh, and compare, in contrast to 2019. I'm also going to show you the Cognitive API. Has any, anyone tried out any of the Azure Cognitive APIs? All right, perfect, one person. So you, there's a premise with this project that eventually you'll do certain things where the model itself doesn't provide the quality of the prediction that you expect. And then you have to, OK, let me talk to a curated AI that does provide quality prediction. And the cognitive APIs themselves are very affordable. Um, in fact, I'm just using the free tier, and it gives me up to 1,000 predictions per second per transaction, uh, per call that I make to the API. And then at the end, we'll, we'll look at uh, Spark Streaming, which is the Scala section in 2019. All right, so demo one, we have five of these. So we're going to add the ML features, grant access as far as the service account that's going to connect to the, to the instance, do some configurations around the instance, and install the pre-trained models. All right, so what am I talking about here? Um, when you go to the Cognitive API, uh, they give you, on the Azure website, the ability to test uh, text. Uh, the text analytics one up here, as you can see on the link, you could type in, uh, they have certain samples, but this is out of a TV show that I love to watch. I, you know, we have two kids, so we watch a lot of cartoons. <laughs> Christina is like, yeah, we do watch a lot of cartoons. Uh, this is from a, this quote is from a TV show called Troll Hunters on Netflix. 
And it doesn't, the API doesn't render that image. I just put that up there so you could, when I say troll hunters, you kind of have a visual of what I mean. But it, has anyone seen tro or watched troll hunters? Awesome. I love you guys. It's about three hands, at least three hands came up. So that's great. So this is the quote where um, Blinky tells uh, Jim, which is our first ever human troll hunter, uh, traditionally, all of the troll hunters have always been trolls, and they live under this city called Arcadia. And it's a very motivating quote. So my question around this was like, okay, what is the sentiment of that line in the TV show? And by sentiment, I mean like how happy or unhappy the verbiage is. So think about if maybe you're in the retail business and someone reviews a product for you. Uh, and they type in a message, like, you know, I like these shoes, the book was great, and so on and so on. But then they actually select the star, and they give it the star. So the, think of the star as an additional feature. In this case, we may be dealing with unstructured data where we just have the verbiage. And I want to get the sentiment of just the verbiage, regardless of what star they gave it. Perhaps the verbiage, they might have given it three stars, or four stars, but maybe there's value in the verbiage itself that tells me exactly a, with a strong uh, precision of how positive or negative uh, those keywords were. And so the Cognitive API does this really well, and that's what we're going to try to achieve here. We're going to try to get this text to inside of the database engine to give me the prediction of 78% that you're seeing here. All right, so we're gonna add the feature. I'm sure everyone here has installed SQL Server. Has someone never installed SQL Server? Okay, no one raises their hand. So you guys are all experts at this. You just select the feature there, Machine Learning Services Language in 2019. I'm going to select R in Python. You, don't, you now definitely have Java here. You could definitely select that option. And then just make your way next through the uh, rest of the installer. So this is the architecture that that feature is going to add. Think of the top diagram of a data inside of the SQL engine communicating to the Launchpad service and then making its way to the satellite DLL and then communicating back to SQL Server via TCP IP. So this is SQL Server talking to an external Python or an external R application or Java application via the satellite service. Or the, or we'll hear this additional window service called the Launchpad process. The bottom section, it's the opposite. The client R application or Python application communicating back into SQL Server, perhaps via ODBC, as you can see here in between. So what I want you to get out of this slide is the execution isolation that Microsoft has done where everything is not just in a single exe where if that EXC has an exploit or if it has a memory leak, it affects the whole stack. So they've definitely isolated these processes so your OTP transactional workload of the SQL.exe service doesn't get impacted if something happens to the Launchpad application or the Launchpad service, all right? So when you add this feature, you're gonna get a new security group called SQL R user group inside of your uh, local security groups. In 2017, this was um, a bit different. The members of that, you will see a list of uh, virtual applications accounts. And in 2016, you would see a list of real application users. So in 2019, it's not like that. It's exactly how you're seeing it here on the screen. All right, another step that we have to do, and I worked, I spent Monday pretty much the whole um, part of the day uh, at, at down at the clinic with the Microsoft folks that, that are writing the ML features. I've been working with them since uh, this was first announced in 2016. They're a super talented group of folks. And they're part of the implementation, the documentation on, online doesn't really emphasize that the firewall on the machine is blocking those virtual accounts that got created to connect externally. So this is a security feature that when they actually run the MSI, they create these firewall rules. And by default, 
mm, the Python application does not have access to connect to the internet. It, you'll get an error that says, WinOS error, unable to connect to an external HTTP source. So we're going to disable that, but the right uh, best practice here is that you grant these firewall rules access to outbound uh, the Azure uh, IPs, per se, because we're going to write a Python application that connects to the Cognitive API in Azure. But I'm just doing this on my, on my laptop. This is not gonna be a production server, so I'm just gonna disable these rules. All right, so we're going to run the SP uh, configure here at the top to enable external scripts. And I, a lot of my code is dark like this because I've been looking at white screen since I'm 13 years old and now I'm, it's like pouring acid into my eyes. So I apologize if the screens are dark and this is hard to see. When you download the slide deck, you can definitely zoom in. But if you need me to zoom in, I can zoom in for you, okay? So we're going to enable uh, external scripts and run reconfigure with override. And then I'm going to grant that user group uh, just access to connect to the instance. No other permissions. All right, then I'm going to restart SQL service, and we're gonna get into the next step. So the next step is this PowerShell script called install ML models. What this is gonna do is download the Microsoft pre-trained machine learning models and the open source machine learning models into the file system of the engine and give you the ability to leverage those pre-trained models within SQL Server. So when I run that PowerShell script, it's expecting the instance name. You wanna run this as administrator. Just right click on PowerShell, run as admin. And if you just do a quick Bing, ser Bing search or Google search for that, uh, PS that PowerShell script name, you'll land on the docs page that you can just download it from. Now I got these two warnings because I've been using multiple iterations here, but this is the expected output. All right, then the next step is we're going to run our setup, again, as administrator from this directory. Uh, for 2019, just submit the RC1 here. I just realized I didn't update the screenshot um, when uh, I updated the local instance of my machine. But it's the same path, just without the RC1. And then execute our setup install component ML, MLM version that 947 that the PowerShell script downloaded. And then the language is the default one. The destination directory is where the Python services themselves are installed. It, specifically to the folder Microsoft ML and then ML libs. And this is going to download the pre-trained models here. You can see AlexNet, ImageNet, pre-trained.model. This one came directly from the Microsoft uh, research team. And these models are open source in the sense that they're already trained on Twitter. They're, uh, they're already trained on social media data. So when we're trying to call uh, unstructured text and try to get the sentiment and we hit these models, they've already been pre-trained by Microsoft for us. Supposedly they're supposed to work, right? But they don't, and, and I'll get to that in a minute here. And so now that we have this feature installed, I'm going to create a store procedure that just exchanges between uh, SQL Server by passing to that uh, pre-trained model uh, a string of text and into a Python application here. And you could see that if it detects that the score is greater than 0.6, it'll be returned as positive, or else it'll be returned as negative. So you could literally copy paste this code. I'm using the Microsoft ML here and importing Rx featureize and the function get sentiment in Python. So our destiny string came back with a score of 0.5. When I executed this for six strings, only six strings, it took 30 seconds. You could see there the baseline, it took 30 seconds. But some of it came back with a meaningful ranking. But when it came around to my data, it had no idea how to process it. It couldn't tell me the sentiment. So 0.5, it's quite common. It means random. It means the model has no clue what to do with this. So it just gives it a 0.5. Now if it's 0.5 with a super strong precision, a wide precision like this, it, it, it did understand it. But if it's just flat out 0.5, like this 50%, it means it has no idea what to do with it. So now we're, we haven't solved our troll hunter problem. We're gonna try to work on that. All right, so a couple of security things, and this is quite important. When you start writing this project, you want to generate a requirements.txt file, 
and publish that, whether to be GitHub or whether to be Azure DevOps. Why? Because these Python modules that we're leveraging, they're open source. They're written by Microsoft employees, by folks that are on the Python project, um, and there are security vulnerabilities behind them. So you, the GitHub, at, out, of the, out of the box, GitHub does a great job at alerting you, and I'll show you examples of that. Uh, and we're gonna profile that Python app in case that you're dealing with some performance issues, right? Because when I got that 0.5 prediction, I'm like, well, maybe there's a problem with my code, and, and I need to run through this, the call stack to see what's going on there. So how you generate the requirements, you could do it with um, Visual Studio. When you create the project and you have the solution inside of the GitHub link that I shared at the beginning, you can right click on the environment itself and you'll get this option that says generate requirements. So this environment is pointing to the Python services path of the binary uh, where the bins uh, sit themselves uh, in the instance. So that requirements at TXT is basically a list of all of the Python modules that are sitting inside of that virtual environment and their version. It'll say 1.6, you're using Pandas 8.0, you're using PIP 9.1, uh, so it's a list of hundreds of all of the modules that are there. Now your Python application might not be using all of them, but we still wanna get like uh, that list of requirements so that when we port this project between one server and another, our, our versions align, that's one reason, and the other reason is that when we commit it to GitHub or we commit it to Azure DevOps, that we get security alerts with regards to those modules in case that any of them need to be updated. And so I'm going to publish that to GitHub. This is a project, and you're seeing here that GitHub alerted me. It says, we found a potential security vulnerability in your dependencies. When GitHub automatically read that uh, requirements, that TXT file, they automatically, out of the, out of the box, told me there were, secure, there were vulnerabilities in my project. Uh, this is an example, pillow, it gives you the celerity, NLTK, it gives you the severity, and you'll get a emails as well here. They will come into your inbox, and they will continue to bother you until you fix or dismiss the, the alert. If you wanna update them, you can do it right through the Visual Studio environment. You click on packages, find the, the package itself, and click on that arrow to do the update. Or you can do it via command line like I'm providing here at the top. All right, then it will prompt you to approve it because it's gonna be an elevated thing as administrator. And this is an example of some of these vulnerabilities. They're quite serious. Uh, SQL Alchemy through and tells you the version, has the ability to expose SQL injection via the order by parameter. So GitHub does, uh, and this is actually uh, reported by a company called CVE uh, that does uh, these evaluations automatically for us. All right, so how to launch, I'm gonna speed it up here. Um, in Visual Studio, you have the ability to click on Analyze, Launch Python Profiling. And that's gonna let you, just like in a .NET app, go through the entire call stack of the Python application so that you could get performance metrics as far as which module is consuming the most out of your project. So that's quite useful, and you could do this in R Studio as well for R applications. Um, you can see here that the python.exe, get sentiment example, it's consuming 100% of the time. And then it's when I do the import lib for file loader get data, that's consuming 47% of the time. So you can continue to step through the call stack. Right there I could see that the top consumer is pandas when I execute, and it goes on. And then it gets into Microsoft ML, Rx Featureize, and so on and so on. So this is the premise as far as why did it take 30 seconds to just do six rows? That's, I think we could do a whole lot better, right? Otherwise it wouldn't be real time. It wouldn't be a real time talk. I'm gonna speed it up now. <laughs> I'm gonna go even faster. So in database ML, we're gonna talk about in the next demo, real time scoring only, this is what you need in order to do a, to serialize a new model to do real-time predictions against. And what I mean by real-time predictions is so that we can call our model using this function called sprxpredict. sprxpredict is new in 2017. And the demos that I have, they're gonna show you the performance metrics of using that function of 2017 versus 2019. Um, the function as well predict 
is new in 2017 as well. Those real-time options weren't available in 2016, as far as I remember. And I'll show you those performance metrics. All right, so I'm going to create a schema here in order to do real-time sentiment analysis. The first uh, code block at the top is basically a, an empty table where I'm going to store uh, my model that the Python application is gonna generate. That model is gonna be written into this table, into the column called uh, model. You can see that it's a var binary. And then I'm going to read from that table using SPRX predict and generate a real-time prediction. All within the database, con contained inside of the database. At that point, it's not gonna leave, the data is not gonna leave the tables or the, the database itself. Okay, so then I'm gonna split up the data in order to do training one view uh, called uh, product reviews training data and the next view called product reviews test data. Why do I need to split this up? This, you know, part of our model, it shouldn't see all of my data. And for example, like uh, certain IoT applications like self-driving cars, the model needs to be very small so that we could get very quick predictions against. If that bar binary is gigabytes in size, any time that I try to paint that model or that I try to read from the table, it's a larger payload. So now, even though it's been trained on a huge amount of information, it's gonna generate uh, predictions slower. So the smaller that I can make that binary, the quicker my predictions are gonna be. Uh, and in the sense of splitting up the data, we don't want to have uh, skew or biases on our training. So this isn't supposed to be, uh, there are other folks that will talk about machine learning in the sense of trying to get always 100% prediction, but I'm not trying to, you know, win the lottery here or get the, get the lottery numbers. You may want to do that, and that's okay. But um, just trying to get a prediction, you know, which way is north type of ordeal. So I'm going to split it by 90% to train on and 10% to test of whatever the data set may be. This is a store procedure that's going to allow me to create the model. Now, this store procedure is not the good one, so I'm just going to not walk you through it. But uh, what we're doing here is building an n-gram of the entire string with two words. If the string itself has 250 words or 1,000 words, my n-gram is just gonna process two words at a time, the compound itself. And so that's pretty common. We typically do two or three, an n-gram of two or, or three. And then it's going to do the first word as well as the inverse, which is gonna reverse the order. So it's going to train on both of them. Um, on both permutations. So I execute that store procedure on my laptop, and this is what it does to my CPU. So if you try to do this on your production server, you will hammer your CPU. Okay, now perhaps you have a supersonic production server, but if you're doing this on your old TP environment because it's the awesome machine that you have, expect your CPU to do this. So be careful there. It does say 20% because it had finished by the time I took the screenshot, but it was pegged at over 80% for every single core. Now that process took a minute and a half to train my model. So for a minute and a half, in theory, our server was crushed, trying to train the model and write the binary to the table. You could see that the binary there got written. All right, in 2019, that took a minute and eight seconds, not a minute and a half in 2017. So you just got some performance metrics there in 2019, out of the box, I didn't, I didn't change any code. All right, so just the same, the model got written to the table. Now this store procedure is going to call that model and give me the actual prediction uh, as a result. And you could see here that I'm passing, I'm um, selecting the data that I'm going to test with uh, SP external script, and I'm outputting the result data, and then I also have a parameter which is the model bin itself, and here I'm getting the model bin instead of the store procedure from the table that I just created. So I run the store procedure, and in 2017, it took 17 seconds to get 9,000 rows. So we just went from six rows at 30 seconds to 9,000 rows in 17 seconds. And the quality of the predictions are good. All right, in 2019, I, got, I was able to get that back in 10 seconds. 
So the same payload, quite a bit faster. 10 seconds versus 17 seconds. All right, the execution plan. So why did I show you a little bit more of the profiling? Because the execution plan has this object, this new object that says UDX, and it tells you that the cost of that external call was 0%. So when you try to optimize this proc, or if you try to get some DMBs out of it, really what's costing you the performance there is that external launcher process. But because of the driver, you're, it's, a, it's a remote procedure call, you're not getting any performance information. So the execution plan is unable to give you any metrics around there. I wish that it would give you at least like the elapsed time, but it doesn't do that. It just does it for the entire proc. And you can see here the functions that it outputted the, at the end. So that's why it was important in a way to show you how to profile the Python app before. All right, so now let's do real time stuff, right? I think we can go even faster than 10 seconds, 9,000 rows. So this is a store procedure that's going to now train a new model. It's going to serialize a new model uh, with real time scoring set to true. And you could see all of the libraries, all the modules that I'm using here at the top. Uh, and this is going to let you write the object in a very small binary, like I mentioned before in the IoT example. The smaller that we can compress that binary, the faster our predictions are going to be. So I execute this store procedure to train the, a new model. And this is what my CPU looks like. So here you're seeing that single threaded operation. And you could parallelize this. You could use multiple threads if you can manage the, the chunk size that SQL is going to pass of the entire payload. You could see all of the threads when they spun up and they spun down. And that took two minutes and 40 seconds to train. In 2019, it took a minute. So we just went and cut that time in half. Um, and this is just on my laptop, but I have some metrics here with regards to my workstation at home, how long it took at the top commented. Obviously, on your production server, it might be even faster. So if I'm going too fast, or if you guys have any questions, it's kind of hard for me to scan the room. Just feel free to shout them. Um, all right, let's take a look here. Uh, now that we've generated this real-time prediction model, we can see that the binary is 6 megabytes versus 55 megabytes. So in size, our new model is a lot smaller. We got tremendous compression by using the Microsoft uh, libraries that are available. Then I have to enable CLR. In your instance, it depends if you can do this. But if you already have custom assemblies that were written by your .NET team, you already have this turned on. If you don't, you have to turn this on. SPRX, um, SP configure, CLR enable, set that to 1, reconfigure with override so it takes effect immediately. And then I'm going to set the database to trustworthy. Now, this is not a best practice thing. You normally want to just mark the assemblies as safe themselves versus just flagging the database as trustworthy. That means that any DLL or any assembly that's inside of the database can do anything in the file system. And I kind of need that right now. I'm just doing this on my laptop. So I'm going to set the database to trustworthy. You don't, again, this is not a recommended best practice. Um, then I'm going to switch into command prompt as administrator and run these commands to install the runtimes that Microsoft ships with the MSI to give us these assemblies inside of the database itself so that we could call SPRX predict. And you can do this at an instance level. Here at the top is going to apply to the entire instance. And here at the bottom is going to scope those assemblies into a specific database. So if you're a multi-tenant environment, you can just do it to one of the databases. You don't have to do them to, all, to the entire server. Um, all right, so that command prompt, this is when I run it for the instance. Sorry, You can see that it adds these assemblies. And then it says uh, the asymmetric keys were uh, succeeded, and RTS install succeeded as well. When I run it to the database, I could zoom in here if you guys need me to. But basically, this is the command. I'm scoping the database. And then at the end, it's going to say install succeeded. And you could see all of the assemblies here that got created. Now when I call, let's see. Now I, we go back to uh, SSMS per se or Azure Data Studio, whichever ID you're using. 
And when you um, call the store procedure SPRX predict, we're going to pass our model as an input. So here I'm grabbing the model at the beginning and assigning it to model bin. It's a declare variable. And I'm inputting the data of the test data, that 10% that the model wasn't trained on. And this generated the predictions in just three seconds. So we went from, thir from six rows at 30 seconds to uh, 9,000 rows in 17 seconds in 2017, 10 seconds in 2019, down to three seconds now. So a lot faster. And that's just the same metric in 2019. It's three seconds. I couldn't get any faster than that. So this is a chart of just running those three workloads on my laptop. If Microsoft has a great presentation on this that they do a million transactions per second. But it's binary. It's not string manipulation. They're not doing the sentiment of the prediction. They're doing it over credit card loans, whether they're going to churn. So the problem here was, let's say your company is trying to predict churn, right? Um, binary predictions are quite simple to do. It's just a true or false. But ultimately, what I cared about is, is the customer happy? If the customer is happy, they're not going to churn. If the customer is unhappy, they're likely going to churn. So that I just needed to generate the sentiment of what the customer uh, feedback was, was signaling. So this is a performance metric of how quickly we were able to get this to run by using the Python external app, the in-database process, and the CLRs themselves. Uh, CLR is definitely a lot faster. Oh, five times faster, as you can see on the screen. All right, so now we still haven't solved the troll hunter problem. I'm going to get to try to solve that problem. Uh, a few things I need to do in order to do this. Uh, we have to cover four JSON path inside of uh, T-SQL. Is anyone familiar with JSON or completely unfamiliar? OK, so a lot of hands in the room. So you're, you're going to be comfortable here. If you're not familiar with JSON and you're familiar with perhaps XML, it's very similar. You just have a body of unstructured text that has definitions of elements. And we'll, we'll look at it in a second. Um, we're going to use also the library JSON normalize inside of Python so that we could deserialize that JSON when we send it to the API. Um, because SPRX predict, when I was doing in the previous example, it still had no idea how to process my troll hunter code as far as I was able to, to get it to run. So I'm I have a notebook called Cognitive API, where all of the code that I'm going to be covering is inside of the repo. And it's going to give you a really good step-by-step uh, -step introduction on how I went about this project. Then I have another notebook called Troll Hunters. And Troll Hunter, the, that Troll Hunter notebook has dialogue, conversational information about of one of the episodes in the TV series. So think about a conversation like we're having right now. It seems to be that only Hiram is speaking. <laughs> but um, the sentiment of that episode, uh, how each character communicated and the lines that they said, uh, is, that notebook is going to give you the predictions. And then I have one that's over a PDF that you might have seen in the news. I may skip that one because some folks are like, they do not like a politically primed demo. And this is not about a politically primed demo. It's just to show you how to process a PDF. You know, I'm not here trying to talk about one precedent or another. I'm just focused on the technology. All right, so here I already spun up the Cognitive API. I went to Azure and the marketplace. I'm not going to show you how to do that. Um, but in the marketplace, if you type in uh, sentiment analysis, it will be the first cognitive API that shows up. So I just created that one. I selected the free tier, and immediately it's going to give you a key. And you take that key. This is the URL string here. Uh, and I pasted the key inside of this Python application. Then I created a sample JSON document, literally hard-coded with some text, just that I can warm up to the sense of pinging data uh, to, the, to the external API, sending data up there. And when I run that Python application, I see a prediction for that document. It's 0.96, this statement right here. So now I'm getting like that warm, fuzzy feeling. OK, this is going well. We're moving in the right direction. Instead of having to go to the website, I was able to call that same API within a Python application. Now let's try to do that in T-SQL, right? 
I'm going to switch my context uh, in Azure Data Studio to SQL. And we're going to look at a view, um, pardon, pardon me, uh, the, the actual for JSON function and set the root of that element to documents, which is the, what the API is expecting. And when I run that select statement, it, the row looks correct. Let's see here. This section here is if I were to send more documents. Here I have one, two. It gives me predictions for more than one. This is still just a Python application. Now this is the view. I'm going to create a view called JSON documents. And the view is that same select statement that I showed before. I'm hard coding that the language of my text is, to, is English. I'm getting the content as text and the row number as an ID so that I, when I run the select statement, it comes back with um, an ID for that document. Now in this section, um, let's see here. Here I'm exchanging within an ODBC call inside of Python uh, to write back to, to the database. And I apologize if I'm going too fast over this. Once you download this deck, you are going to be able to step literally step by step through this. But I'm trying to get to the Scala demo. All right, so when we, get, when we run this Python application, we get predictions. And this literally just communicated between the database uh, back and forth already. I wasn't hard coding any of the data inside, inside that Python application. If you ever have to do a PAP upgrade within Azure Data Studio, you could do it just the same with this command. Uh, and what I was referring to there is with regards to the requirements and the CVE alerts. All right, so now that we have that JSON document within our view, we could copy paste it into a dictionary. And that's going to create a data frame and uh, write the output to a table that I created. And this is a static table. It's not a temp table, even though I'm dropping and recreating. And I'm saving the results into this table called API results. So just the ID of the document and the score that the API came back with. All right, so now this is the sort of procedure, get cognitive API. So here I'm going to put my, my actual key. I didn't include it in the, super, in the screenshot, but you guys get the point. You saw what the key looks like before. This super procedure runs, and right here it's going to exchange uh, between SPA execute external scripts. The input will be that view that we created before, JSON documents. And it's going to deserialize the document of the array location zero and send it via requests to the cognitive API itself. So that's going to come back and then I'm going to normalize that JSON uh, as documents and write it to the table. Uh, right here you can see where I'm writing it to the table. And by doing an insert of the output of SPR ex, uh, XP external, uh, execute external scripts, pardon me. So the store procedure, now we get into the, into the Troll Hunter demo. The Troll Hunter uh, notebook has that dialog information that I was telling you before. But you, I think you guys do trust me by now that the cognitive API is giving me meaning, meaningful predictions, right? Does anyone need to see that, like real life? Do you need me to press F5 and run it? No, I don't see any hands come up. OK, perfect. So the Troll Hunter uh, notebook does the same information now with that quote of the TV show. I'm using the same view. I'm doing it over real data, none of the fictitious Microsoft samples. My product reviews are not, the, the data that I'm dealing with is not they like the book. It's TV show dialogue conversational. So Microsoft doesn't have samples on how to do that. Um, and when you, let's say, quote unquote, if you're trying to do this over call logs or uh, insurance feedback, Microsoft doesn't have samples on how to process that sort of data, OK? So I create the same view. This one's going to be called JSON quotes, not JSON documents. But the structure of the view is just the same. I'm just reading from a table called quote, not a table uh, where I had the product reviews before. So here, we're going to create a new sub procedure now called get cognitive API code sentiment. This one's going to ping the Cognitive API, the same structure that you saw before. I'm going to deserialize the JSON itself. 
and write it back to the table API results. When I run this, let me see. Oh, this is the rest of the body. So this sort of procedure is quite lengthy, it's just so I can include it in the screenshot and the font size will be big. These are lines one through 26, and then this is lines uh, 25 through 44. That's the context of the entire store procedure. So I execute that store procedure, and I could see that in the quotes table, now I have predictions. Some of it, it still came back as 0.5. But our quote that I was showing you in the screenshot of the website, that did come back with a 0.78. So that's somewhere here along this stack. It's inside of this payload because I quoted it in there. So when you do run this notebook, you'll, you'll see that it came back as 0.78. And you could see the characters and each of the sentiments. And that entire, the sample set, it only has 100 rows. So it, it was pretty quick. It was less than a second or something like that to ping the cognitive API. That cognitive API, when I spun it up in Azure, it was an ECUS two. So the proximity of the network communication was pretty close to my data center. So the response was pretty, uh, pretty fast. So now I have an idea, right? Well, what if we get an average of all of the characters and who spoke the most positive and who spoke the most negative? We can see here that Claire had an average of 86%. Otto, an average of 0.07. So the, now we're getting like really meaningful data out of our uh, strings. And in a way, in a, reality, in a real problem, what I was after wasn't really whether they were positive or negative. I was trying to get which ones were the worst, the most negative ones. Because in the insurance, you're not gonna deal with positive reviews. You're always gonna deal with negative reviews. And the question is, which ones are the worst, like the true worst ones? So that maybe this feature could be used as some sort of prioritization so that we could remedy uh, certain issues with our customers in a timely manner. Now, I kinda, the demo kinda at this point walks back into SPRX Predict. And I spoke with the team on Monday, and unfortunately what's SPRX Predict doing right now is that it's comparing how close or um, how familiar or, uh, one string compares to, the, to another string. Like how similar are they? It's even though I'm passing the features and I'm using, and I'll get to this in a second here, of uh, multi-class uh, classification, which is categorizing of in, into bins of sections of which one's positive and which one's negative, or which one's in the higher end of the prediction and which ones are on the lower end of the prediction. Uh, we believe that the model right now, it's not, uh, SPRX predict, it's not behaving towards this particular problem that I'm trying to solve. So the premise here is that with uh, Azure SQL Edge, did anyone not see the keynote on Wednesday? Everyone saw the keynote on Wednesday. Okay, so the device that they were using um, is running a specific version of SQL Server that only runs on that piece of hardware, and it runs on Linux. It's basically a container image, but that uh, binary is able to process Onyx models. So think of um, a TensorFlow model that processes images, that gets prediction, but it got converted from a TensorFlow model uh, via Onyx into a new VAR binary that that, uh, bi that version of SQL Server can generate predictions out of an Onyx model. So this, and we're not talking about right now SQL Server 2020, but that product is already available. And there, there are definitely bringing in more features of we can use Onyx models in Windows. Um, that, so you should see some uh, releases coming up around this. But the rest of the code stack here kind of steps back. We're like, okay, now that I have tag data, and by tag I mean like those strings of the TV show, that were ranked 78%, 50%. Now I have some tag data that I could train over to do local uh, real-time predictions with SPRX predict. The, the rest of the schema that's there will show you 
uh, where I go there, but it kind of gets to the point where it fails. Now, if you're just doing binary predictions of like when the cloud, uh, when the crowd clapped, that's a binary prediction. It's an on or off. It's a, a one or zero. Um, if you're trying to generate predictions all over that sense, you could definitely do uh, do it with this schema over that data. So here I'm, I'm splitting up in my training view into bins the tag data. So if the uh, prediction that came back from the API is between 0.1 and 0.2, means between 10% and 20%, that's gonna fall into bin one. And so on and so on, all the way up to bin nine. All right, so I'd split it up that way. Create a view for testing. This one is going to be over 20%. Here, in this case, I'm I'm, tra I'm testing I'm training over 100% because it's only the quotes in the table where the sentiment is not null. That means that the cognitive API gave me a ranking. So I'm going to train over all of the ones that do have a ranking, and try to use SPRX predict against the ones that I didn't that I never sent to the cognitive API where I don't have a sentiment for. All right, so then this is the same sub procedure that you guys saw before in the Cognitive API uh, notebook using real-time scoring set to true right here at the bottom. Everyone can see, though, do you need me to zoom in? You can zoom in a little bit. Right there it says real-time scoring set to true. All right, write that to the table. This is the binary now, it's one megabyte because this data is not a whole lot. It wasn't 9,000 rows, it was like less than 100 rows. So that model is quite small. Or pardon me, 19 kilobytes, not, not one megabyte. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> All right, so then we're going to call SPRX predict. And I'm going to pivot the output. So you guys saw before, the output uh, before was three columns for each bin. So this is gonna show you how to pivot that output so that you can just show the predictions ordered versus uh, horizontally. All right, so this pivots the output of SPRX predict. You have all the code on how to do that. Hiram did the work for you. This is how SPRX predict normally spits it out and then through the pivot, I could see it this way. So what's happening here is that it's, uh, I sent it 14 documents 14 dialogues of the TV show that the Cognitive API didn't give me a sentiment for. And it predicted that they're all sevens. They're all in that bin of 70%. That doesn't make any sense to me because there are, some of them are quite different. So this is the part where I was telling you that the model is, or SPX predict function is uh, detecting how similar the string is to another. It's not really detecting the sentiment of the string. So what I ended up doing is I operationalized this solution by calling the Cognitive API every single time. As I'm dealing with this data, a, whether it be a report that gets generated, your definition of real time may be different. And sometimes all they need is a paginated report. So I'll show you an example of that. The PDF demo is very similar to the Troll Hunter demo, but I take the text of the PDF, this is all of the text, and then I show you, um, I skip the part where I show you which president for the sake of something, I didn't want to do that. But if you run that demo yourself, you will see which president spoke more positive or more negative. All right, so the same structure as far as how to process a PDF versus a TV show dialogue. So back to the, and this part is blank because I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to bring up a comparison. I was at the beginning before we got started, if anyone was interested in seeing a HammerDB demo uh, to get performance metrics of 2019. Yeah, question? Uh, for the PDF part, doesn't yeah. the Cognitive API have a 5,000 character limit? Um, I'm not really sure. You know, honestly, I haven't dealt with the limit in the sense that we could look up the limit restrictions of. The, but you're talking about the, the. So the question was, does the doesn't the cognitive API have a 5,000 character limit? Uh, I believe it's possible we could look at it, but I believe that you're 
your question is around the entire document, yeah. and I'm sending one line within the document of what President A said, and then another line of what President B said. So that line, sure, it might be more than 5,000 characters, but in the, the example of this PDF that I was dealing with, it wasn't. Uh, so the Cognitive API processed that in its entirety. Uh, but we can definitely look at the, the features of the Cognitive API if we have a minute. Now, Microsoft will show you beautiful demos of HammerDB and how fast SQL Server is. Uh, 2019 is great, and, and I can't wait to deploy it in production. Uh, this is a standard VM in my infrastructure, real-world performance metric right there. If I were to throw 2019 onto my ten tree environment with ESX Server, local 100% on-prem, this is the performance I'm going to get out of it. Um, and this is a standard TPC uh, workload. So I have another slide, which is why the previous one was blank, and that I'm going to paste the screenshot of the 2017 number that I got for on, literally on that very same VM. So I'm comparing apples to apples in this case. It's just a new binary. Uh, same storage backend, same VM, same CPU allocation, same memory allocation, same OS, um, same data center. Everything is just the same. So uh, I will upload this uh, throughout the day to the, to the repo. So when you guys perhaps download it tomorrow or at the end of the day, this previous slide that's blank right now um, will have the 2016 number so you could see the comparison of one to the other. And it, if I remember correctly, I think I was getting somewhere around 210 or 230 transactions per minute in the 2017 demo but I, I will include it there. All right, so back to our real-time conversation and how in the sense uh, we need to visualize these predictions. Once you write it to the database, it's just data. You can consume it from anywhere. Power BI has a great example of how you could do this with M and call the Cognitive API just as well, and then it's a column inside of your Power BI report. But then it's just there, and you gotta figure out now how do I take it out of this Power BI report, or maybe consume this Power BI report inside of your CRM app and go through embedded and so on and so on. So my, my, the way that I went through implementing this is that I did it via T-SQL by calling Python directly and calling the, the Cognitive API. And from there, I could consume it from anywhere. I can consume that sentiment from my CRM app within a paginated report like you're seeing here. And in reality, the department that's looking at this, they're, they're, this is the busiest report that we use in, an, in our entire uh, analysis platform. This report gets hammered 24-7. Um, that is the definition of real time in my job. Uh, so perhaps in yours, it might be similar, it might be different, but I just added an input parameter here at the top, giving them the option to get the sentiment and when, by default, this is set to no. When it's set to yes, the store procedure that generates the grid, the, ta the tablets here in this SSRS report, will call the Cognitive API and then write it to the table that's called API results, like I showed it before, uh, and show the sentiment. Now I grayed out, obviously, all the PI data that's in here, and this, again, is just a very fictitious company. This has nothing to do with the company that, that I'm working for, Universal Property. Uh, but that, that is a very good, a successful implementation to the, to the point where literally this, the email that I received back from the CEO of the company was, um, he said something like, he said great thinking. And he, he told me like, you know, there is a lot of value in this. Like, we're very serious about customer satisfaction. Without our customers, we're, we, we're not in business. So to get an email like that from the CEO of the company, it's literally <laughs> worth all the code that I wrote, all the hard effort that I put in to get into this. And we're really after making our customers happy. All right, so that's that. Uh, with regards to Yelp, I'm not gonna get into Yelp. Yelp is kind of uh, boring topic, but uh, if I backpedal here to this one, uh, before you do anything like this in prod, 
make sure that you get approval from your legal team. <laughs> do not, you do not want to be the next Cambridge Analytica. OK? Has anyone not seen the great hack? Everyone's seen the great hack. One person hasn't seen the great hack. Two people. OK, so watch the great hack on Netflix if you have a minute. Or just watch the trailer if you don't have an hour to spare. Um, the company called Cambridge Analytica, and they talk about what this was doing and the legal implications behind it. So the terms and conditions, which is why that Yelp API uh, context came up, um, these social media networks, uh, and the next demo that I'm going to get to is with Scala that talks to Twitter, uh, they have very strong terms and conditions. And thankfully, nowadays, they're super simple to understand. They're not long, infinite scroll <laughs> that no one ever reads. They're super simple to understand, and they're very explicit about what you do with public data in their network. Uh, one of the, which the slides that will come up here, is Yelp literally telling me, Hiram, you cannot do this for B2B analysis. If you do this, you have to show it to the user publicly that you're doing this. On your website or somewhere, they have to know that you're doing this with our data and our network. So the terms and conditions are very strong. And if you try to do this, you may even get banned from that network. Like you'll lose your credential. And uh, and so on, and who knows what else. So the, the message that I'm trying to get across here is, uh, number one, ask the head of your company to run it by the legal team to see if you could do this. If they say that they ha they're covered in the sense of their customers have accepted for you to do analysis when you dial in any hundred number over what's being said over the phone, then you're covered. You know, I let the attorneys do those do those uh, contracts. I'm j I just write the code. Um, so yeah, this is the response from Yelp. It's truncated. Their API support development team sends me an email, tells me, Hiram, uh, you know, you cannot use this for B2B. You have to show it to the customer. Um, so let's talk about Scala, right? Um, any, well, I think there was one person that said he had written R. And so I'll step out here and show you Azure Data Studio in a second. Let me drink some water because I've been speaking very fast. And we have 10 minutes left. So I'm, feel free to ask if you have any questions. Um, let's see here. I do have to do the raffle as well. I'm just thinking about time. So let's, let's drop out into Azure Data Studio. Da, 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 da. Inside of that code repo, you're going to see a notebook called Spark Twitter. All right. Do you need me to turn this light? I could I could muster the the acid <laughs> in my eye sockets for this notebook is straight out of the Microsoft samples repo, but I work with them on Monday to fix an issue that the notebook has that uh, it's not. Uh, corrected on the public repo yet, you will see a commit to that. If you happen to get it from the samples uh, and compare it to mine, mine has the fix in it. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and publish this to the, to the public repo. So I'm going to first create a Twitter developer account, similar to how I did with Yelp, and that's going to give me a set of keys. I'm going to, I have a big data cluster already deployed. I'm not going to walk you through that, but inside of the repo, you will see another notebook that shows you how to deploy a big data cluster. The deployment process for a big data cluster is pretty simple. With Azure Data Studio, you just right click, deploy SQL Server. And then that there's going to think of this like the new MSI. Uh, it's going to be a matter of maybe four clicks. And then it's going to start uh, a notebook. And you just hit run all cells. And it's going to automatically deploy the big data cluster for you. So why did I deploy a big data cluster? Because I wanted to run Spark to uh, stream the data that's in social media into SQL Server so that I can do this sort of sentiment analysis over. Now, there are uh, public use cases of how Walmart, for example, uh, does real-time predictions of when they need to send inventory to their stores, perhaps what team won the, base the baseball game. 
uh, in what city, do they need to send it to San Francisco at a specific store? And all of this is based on Facebook activity of people that are posting pictures of themselves or text, unstructured data. Um, I think they generate the, the article talks about Walmart generating over 45 petabytes an hour, something like that. It's, the volume of data is just absurd. Um, so they they use this implementation. It's just going to look at Twitter. Uh, it's going to have filters in it. Think of it those filters like hashtags or usernames, uh, certain uh, word clauses per se that we're going to scrape that social media network so that we can uh, write that streaming that stream into HDFS. Then we're going to create an external table. So we're not going to materialize this data fully into SQL Server. We're just going to create ex an external table that reads from the HDFS file system where the streams have, uh, are being written by, by Scala. All right, so then and this, is, this is a matter of just a few key steps here. Create the Twitter account, run a couple of setup steps here. Create the database. This is just an empty database called Twitter data. I get the server name. That's the output. Do you need me to zoom in a little bit? Yeah. Is that better? Then I'm going to create this is uh, an external data source to the SQL data pool where the stream is being landed on. Then I'm going to create that an empty external table. Then I'm going to create a login to be able to talk to the SQL data pool from my Scala application. All right. So this login is going to have the password of one two three bang um, and pound. It's going to have access to read and write on the data pool itself. It's going to be a regular login in SQL Server, not SS admin or anything around that. And it's going to have reader and writer into the, in the database itself. And this section of the block, uh, this code cell is what's not on the, on the public repo. Like this is the fix to the notebook. OK, so that runs. I switch the kernel to Scala. And here I import the modules that I'm going to be using, similar to Python. I was importing requests and JSON normalized. These are the ones that we're importing in Scala. Here I could see the Spark UI when uh, our new job uh, got created. And when I, when I click on that link, it takes me here to this, to this screen. And this is the Spark log of um, my big data cluster. And the other link, it shows me uh, more log information as well. All right, so those were those two links, the Spark UI and the driver log. So that code cell succeeds. My, uh, libraries are imported. Then I have to put in the parameters to my Twitter application that I created to be able to authenticate. Uh, I, I will reset these keys and these tokens. Uh, you will have to create your own, obviously. And then the user that has access to the data pool, I pass it in here. Uh, and the rest is just the default. This is the same uh, server name that it detected and the port the default one, the database that we're going to be working over. This is the JDBC connection string based on the, uh, the variables that are uh, declared right up here. So we uh, create an additional variables, and these are our filters, right? So I ran this already last night at like at almost midnight when I was quoting this demo, and <laughs> no one was tweeting about past summit last night. But uh, there was some activity with some of the other filters. Um, <laughs> So then we define the Twitter stream. This is a very large code block that I'm not going to walk through. Uh, all right. So that is the Spark job itself. Let me see. Where was I? Define the Twitter stream. Define the Twitter stream. OK, yeah, that's this code block here. Run the next one as well. Then this actually starts the job. When you start the stream, you're going to start writing the data to the HDFS uh, data pool, the SQL data pool. So when, now when I expand the HDFS uh, folder here in Azure Data Studio, I could see a new folder that came up called Twitter. 
and here I could see all of the uh, data that my stream wrote. So it's automatically splicing it into multiple parquet files and so on. And we're going to try to read that data through SQL uh, as an external table. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to test reading it through Scala. So this is going to show you how to write that query in Scala. Uh, we're going to create a, uh, a data frame. And these are, think of this like the columns that we're going to grab and the select statement itself that we're going to use. So we create that data frame. This writes the data to the external, okay, so this writes the data to the external table so that now we can query it through, through SQL. And then here, this authenticates to the SQL data pool. This part had a bug in the notebook that I, we were able to fix on Monday. And then I run the select from the data frame and I could see that there's data already uh, as we saw when we navigated to the HDFS cluster but I'm able to display that output inside of Scala as well. But just using, uh, this is the name of the new data frame. I'm saying grab the 10 rows. Got it. And I'm showing them. All right, so then I stop the stream. So no more IoT data coming in. Uh, let's switch into the context of SQL. So when I switch into the context of SQL, I run the select statement and I, I have the ability to use any word clause here and I get the text. So you guys now, you're all professionals at doing real-time sentiment analysis. That text came in from Twitter. Now you know how to get the sentiment out of it if you have to, all right? I'm not gonna show you how to do it because I'm not trying to get banned from Twitter on day one. <laughs> So, but you could order it, right? The Tech Republic clearly has the highest number of followers, so that now you have some insights of which ones to go by. Um, and so the premise here is kind of like the keynote that they spoke on Thursday. Uh, there is, it might be a competitor, it might be fraudulent that is driving negative feedback on your business. So there, this is important, this is meaningful. So that kind of concludes the demo here. Do, do you guys have any questions? No questions. i show you how to visualize it. Is anyone using Sandans in Azure Data Studio? Yeah, one person? Not yet, not yet. Not yet. So Sandans is pretty cool. I show you here a screenshot of, uh, it's kind of like the Sandans Visual and Power BI. Uh, you can take that output grid that came out here. I basically just clicked on this icon and it gave me the uh, Sandes visualization that I could see that uh, Tech Republic was a hot point inside of my, my data set. All right, so Sandes is pretty cool. So let's summarize. We talked about adding the ML features, how to execute the components, grant access, the configuration, how to install the pre-trained open source models, uh, how to code in Python, how to profile this, uh, uh, our application as well, how real-time scoring uh, is only set to true is the fastest way, and SPRX predicts, which is uh, the CLR assemblies are the fastest. Now, when I demo some of this, sometimes people are like, well, it's compiled code. Yeah, <laughs> if, you, if, you wanna, if you wanna go slow, if you wanna go fast, I wanna go fast. So it is compiled code. Those assemblies, they come into memory as DLLs. Azure Data Studio, I showed you how to switch the kernels between SQL and Scala, how to leverage the cognitive API and use requests, JSON, JSON normalize, uh, for JSON path inside of T-SQL, and the Spark streaming so that you can do your own sentiment analysis in a big data cluster if you're interested. These are all the resources of everything that I have covered. The link to my blog is there at the top. The link to download all of these slides and all of the code that I use, that's where you will go find the latest episodes of Troll Hunters as well on Netflix. Uh, other machine learning services tutorials from Microsoft. Uh, a lot of workshops that are available out there. A lot of free content, the link to the AI lab. If you haven't already spun up like your own subdomain, your company name called AI lab, why not? <laughs> Go ask your infrastructure folks, hey, I want to have a web server and a subdomain called AILab.company name and do some experimentations there on your company. 
it samples with regards to R, uh, components in Python. That is the link that shows you that architecture diagram that I went over. How to thre uh, thread ML. If you want to, I just use one thread, but if you want to optimize it, perhaps you're dealing with a larger data set. And this is the link to download the latest version of SQL Server. And if you're like day one on how to write an R application to use this or a Python application, this link here is the instructions that I would give any R developer or any Python developer. That is the level one step to get into this, um, into this uh, sort of technology. It was a level 400, so we went uh, very deep. If you guys have a minute to fill out the eval that I have, Again, this data, I do not uh, share it, and we'll go ahead and do the raffle. So if your name uh, is common, definitely put it in a number. So like that, when I run the random uh, script, uh, it doesn't um, group them. I'll leave that there for a minute. I'm a little bit over time. So I have, if you guys could fill this out rather quickly, I appreciate it. It's just going to ask you rate it one through five. What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? If you rather fill it out later, then you could do it later. That's fine. But to do the raffle, it has to be filled out right now. Yes, sir. So do I understand? I just want to make sure I understand what you did right. So you, mm -hmm. you did um, the SPRX predict, but you weren't happy with the results of it. Correct. So then you went sent it to Cognitive Services, and you were happy with those results. But then did you then train another model on the results of the Correct, correct. So great question. The question is like, Hiram, can you summarize it a little bit with, with regards to what you were happy and unhappy that I, uh, I sent it to the Cognitive API. I used our SPRX predict at the beginning. I wasn't happy with the results in the beginning of SPRX predict. So I, correct. The, what I did was send it to the Cognitive API. I wrote some of that output over a small data set. Then I trained a new model. And then I use SPRX predict again to uh, generate new predictions. But what I ended up operationalizing was just calling the Cognitive API. And how was the performance of the Cognitive API? It's really, it's really fast. It's perf performant enough that I could call this real time at work. And were you doing that row by row, or were you batching it? I was batching 1,000 at a time. Okay. Every time that I call the HTTP request, I send 1,000 documents. And that is the limit of the free tier. Has everyone had a chance to fill this out? All right, cool. So let's do the raffle real quick. This is my contact information. Escape here. This one. Uh, da, 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 da. Genie and Pal. Genie and Pal. Genie. Okay. Pal. No. Okay. That's you. <laughs> Congratulations. There you go.